Great. Okay. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Jack. Uh, I'm from Sweden. I'm an exchange student. So my background's mathematics, but now I do industrial ecology uh, towards public policy. So a bit of a mix. Uh, I'm going to try to combine the last two talks. So I'm going to talk about uh, algorithms and feedback loops, specifically for social decisions. And I'm going to start off this talk with a book recommendation and a question. Weapons of Math Destruction by Kathy O'Neill. Has anybody read it? Okay, cool. I'm going to be a bit interactive in this uh, presentation. What did you guys think of it, if you want to give a short uh, commentary, maybe? Yeah, polarizing. Polarizing. Good, good answer. Do you have one, too? Okay, sorry. Uh, but yeah, polarizing, sure. So weapons of math destruction, how big data increases inequality and threatens democracy. That's a big, big statement. But I'm going to use the concept, the concept of weapons of math destruction, from this book to analyze a few cases of algorithms for social decision. So a weapon of math, destruc math destruction, WMD for short, is an algorithm that has three qualities. It's opaque. Large scale, and it's potentially harmful. Okay, now you might ask, are there any such algorithms? Why are we caring about this? But I think this type of algorithm, whether they exist or not, is where they have in mind when you start thinking of, okay, what are we using AI or other types of algorithms for? Uh, and the example that I'm going to give. Uh, the first one comes from Refugee Policy, and it's from a paper from here from ETH, a bit of a long name of the paper, Improving Refugee Integration Through Data-Driven Algorithmic Assignment. Okay, great. What's, what's the issue when we uh, are taking in refugees? Well, we want to have integration. Big word, what could that mean? could mean a lot of things. In this case, we're going to think of it as uh, employment outcomes. We accept people, and we see in 90 days or in a year, do they have a job? Uh, this specific paper is looking at the States and Switzerland, and uh, it's a pretty simple idea. So depending on where you're assigned, where, where in the country you're put, you will have different employment outcomes. Some cities have more jobs than others. Hard to change. That's a fixed resource. And on the other side, depending on who you are as a refugee, you'll have different employment outcomes. The type of data that we're looking at at this point is the sex of the refugee, the age, nationality, and education. This also makes sense. If you have uh, more education, it's easier to get a job, generally. That's also hard to change. But let's instead look at the interactions here. Who you are and where you put can have different interactions. So if you're from a French-speaking country, it's better to be put in a French-speaking area of Switzerland. That makes sense, too. So how this normally is done is that you have an agency, and they look, uh, OK, who is this person? Where do we put them? Fine. The idea here instead is start looking at uh, statistics, both Switzerland and the States before this study. We're just pretty much randomly placing out people. So you have a pretty good idea of how placing and personage interacts. Okay, we could, we could optimize this. We can optimize the probability because we have statistics based on the person, the statistics based on the place. Uh, so let's just try to optimize uh, the probability of employment in 90 days or a year, whatever the case may be. So here's where the thing gets a bit tricky, and when we're coming back to the concept of weapons of mass destruction. And that's, you don't have individuals as refugees generally. You have cases, and cases are families, which means you have two people. At least they have to think about uh, the employment. And generally, it's a man and a woman. So what they did in this study, what Switzerland and the States apparently asked for, is to optimize for that at least one person in the family gets a job in 90 days. So that's the objective function, globally the uh, probability of getting this. Can anybody already now see what the issue is with this? It's a bit hard, but if somebody has a guess, I'd love to hear it. Okay. 
should be the case, and that seems like a good thing. What else could be an issue? Or that's a good thing. Do we have issues? Yeah. Possibly, and then, and then that person never gets integrated. Well, something that you see, especially with refugees, is that the sex is a really important factor. So if you're male, it will be much easier to get a job than if you're female. And, of course, an algorithm can latch onto this. An algorithm can then, okay, but we'll base our assignment on the sex more than anything else. Uh, I discussed this with uh, Professor Heingartner, I think uh, it's pronounced, uh, that, and this might be a consequence of this type of algorithm. That is that you're optimizing after a very reasonable thing, who gets a job, but because of the data, which was mentioned in the earlier uh, talk, you get a slightly problematic outcome. That is, the men get way more jobs than the women. Okay, that's bad. That's something you can think about and something you can maybe try to uh, change. But it gets a bit worse, and here's where it gets complicated. Uh, so if you, let's say, use this algorithm on a large scale, that's that point. So first, harmful, has a gendered bias, might uh, cause integration problem. But because it's used on a large scale, it might actually change the world that it's trying to predict on. And of course, if you have enough refugees, that will change the environment and the places where you're placing them, and you'll have to gather new data. So you gather new data, and you put it back into the model. Anybody see an issue with this? Yeah, right, because you already made a biased choice, which means that the bias is reinforced. So not only is the algorithm is not maximizing employment outcomes, it's maximizing employment outcomes for men, and then at the same time, potentially minimizing employment outcomes for women. So even if you begin with unbiased data, you'll end up with an extremely biased world, which the algorithm reinforces. Here's when, you're, when you're starting using large-scale and harmful algorithms, you can start shaping a world which is worse off than you began with. That is, uh, in a case like this, uh, bias and accuracy go together. When it's more unfair, it's less accurate. And here we come to the opaque part, and maybe start discussing um, things with value-sensitive design. How many thinks that uh, the refugees are told that they're being used an algorithm? You don't have to apply, uh, answer, it was more of a rhetorical one. They're not, of course. And even if they were, they wouldn't be able to question that specific thing of what objective uh, function are we using. It's a bit too detailed question. So how would we go about, about trying to change an algorithm like this? Well, we'd start thinking about the stakeholders, the most important ones are the refugees, the people living in the areas where they're assigned, actually talking to them and what their, um, what their needs are. Uh, and maybe also just imagining, I mean, in this case, we can see that that type of bias isn't a good thing. But also talk to the people working with, with immigration questions uh, and refugees, the assignment center. They're interested in effectivizing this and also using any type of positive outcome you can get from an AI or other types of algorithms. And spontaneously, you change the uh, objective function. Uh, some sort of linear combination between the two might be a good idea. But the problem comes back here with this, there's a feedback loop, and it's not obvious what would happen. So in this case, we don't have uh, empirical evidence, but there are times where we have it. So has anybody here heard about PredPol? I guess you read the book has. PredPol stands for predictive policing. Okay, it's also, also pretty simple, but pretty uh, smart way of thinking about data. So let's say you're a police officer, and you want to find out where crime in your city is happening. Uh, and you have a master's in data science. Uh, so you divide up the city in areas. And every time there's a crime, you record it. Spot. Spot there, spot there, spot there, spot there. And then, okay, there's some areas that are more, there's more crime, and maybe you have a bit more complicated algorithm than just recording it. Uh, and there are some algorithms that are based on seismic activity. Uh, so it's interesting how those might be related. Uh, so then you try to predict where crime will happen in the future. And then you just spend more time there. Whenever police uh, has some time over, they'll be in that area. And now again, does anybody see an obvious issue with this? Yeah, 
course. They have bias in data gathering, which will reinforce the fact that you should spend more time in that area because there's loads of crime in the areas around them. Now, there's a small detail that comes in with how you gather crime. So, like, you could do like I just didn't just say crime. But what's crime? I mean, crime is whatever we decide it is, which means that if you're in the States, it will be a lot of small drug violations, it will be vagrancies. If you go piss on a wall, that's crime. Which means that these types of algorithms, and that has been empirically shown, biases the system to spend more time in poorer neighborhoods. Neighborhoods that don't necessarily have more violent crime, the type of crime you actually want to uh, stop and catch, but just these small crimes. Crimes that if you did it at a college party, you wouldn't get caught. So, it, and then you start affecting these areas. Again, changing the data, causing a feedback loop, being both unfair and inaccurate. So th this is something that can come up again and again when you start thinking about algorithms, harm, and large scale. Again, here, what's been the issue with a lot of uh, predictive policing is that as a citizen, you can actually question what the police are doing. Not in the same way as they can question what you are doing. Uh, a similar type of systems are um, systems that try to predict if a criminal is going to do crime again. It's also with some of the intricacies in uh, the American legal system. But the idea here is also pretty simple. We check your data. Who are you? And then, what have you done? Are you going to uh, commit crime again? And then, are we gonna, what type of um, sentence are we going to give you based on the crime that you've committed? Similar reasoning here. We start thinking, okay, this is an algorithm that could potentially be used at large scale. You could use it at any sentencing of any individual. It's potentially harmful because the data of who you are is not you as an individual. So you can generalize and then just... Uh, give people quite longer sentences that you other, than you otherwise would. And it's opaque because you can't question algorithms if you're just a normal person. And often these algorithms are private, going back to the discussion we had before, if they're government or a privately owned. And a privately owned uh, algorithm, you're not allowed to look at. That's a trade secret. So in, in this case, as an individual, say you've been smoking pot in the States, even if you shouldn't, uh, and you're from the wrong group, you have no question, you have no say about it, and you get a longer sentence. Uh, okay, a, lo a, lo a lot of small examples. So let's maybe go back to uh, the one about refugee uh, assignment. And maybe ask, what is a good idea? So we discussed if whether we should have companies, NGOs, and uh, governments doing this type of thing. Here's an example of all of them, in some sense, involves the government and have some governments doing it, still being pretty bad outcomes. So I'm going to ask the question after these small examples, even though outcomes aren't great, there are algorithms that you could question and work with and maybe change. Do people still think that all algorithms should be, make, be made by uh, companies? And somebody can raise your hands now if you think that algorithms should be made by companies. Okay, cool. <laughs> nice. Then I think this talk at least had some effect. Um, and if you were going to have a takeaway, it's that whenever you, somebody proposes, this is an algorithm we could use for a good thing, ask, can we, uh, can we look at it? Is it opaque? Is it transparent? What's the situation there? Will it be used on large scale, and might it be harmful? Because then you might be in a situation where you have an incredibly negative feedback loop doing the opposite of what you wanted to do. Thanks. <laughs>